the triumphal entry, or as Daryl likes to call it, the A-triumphal entry, right? That's right. What's going on at this point in Jerusalem where people are coming into the city? Well, they're coming in to celebrate a feast, and I, I, li- I liken it to being at a football stadium and people parking their cars and getting ready to come in, and they all come into the same locations the same time. They're coming from all over the country. So it's a, it's a gathering throng, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, what the reason for the A-triumphal as opposed to the triumphal is, is that normally when a dignitary shows up, Uh, to a city, what happens is the city gathers its prominent people and they go out and meet this prominent person coming to the city and escort this person into the city. Uh, it, it's much like the way in the modern world a VIP might be greeted by the nation's leader's hosts if they're you know coming from another country, that kind of thing, and then walk on a red carpet, et cetera, with a lot of pomp and circumstance. And so, for example, if Pilate was coming into Jerusalem, he would be greeted by the Jewish leaders and they would escort him into the town as a way of showing their respect for his uh, position. And so the reason then the entry of Jesus called an a triumphal entry is because he presents himself as a king, at least that's how the disciples are presenting him. Granted, it's a humble king, but still he's presenting himself as a king, and there's no reception and welcome coming from the other side. Mm -hmm. Uh, In fact, there's protest. Mm -hmm. So um, that kind of sets the scene for the nature of Jesus' ministry. He's been presenting himself uh, as this hope for Israel. He's been supported by miracles that I like to call PowerPoints, points about his power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of all that evidence, uh, people, a significant number of people are not responding as opposed Mm -hmm. to welcoming what he's doing. And the entry into Jerusalem is a little cameo snapshot of that reality. Mm -hmm. So he's he's starting to become much more public now. That's right. And one of the things that is happening with this ride on the donkey into into town, which uh, is an allusion to Zechariah's passage about about uh, arrival on a on a donkey of a humble king. One of the things that's happening is is that Jesus has been very circumspect about claiming who he is in public. He's he's talked privately about this with his disciples, and even gaining the confession at Caesarea Philippi, he tells them, "Don't tell anybody," because the public has a certain expectation of what Messiah is going to be, and then there's the kind of Messiah Jesus is going to be, and they don't match. So so he doesn't want to create a sense of false expectation. But when he comes to Jerusalem, he's, he's going to force matters. He's going mm-hmm. to publicly reveal who he is, declare by his actions what he is doing, because the first thing he does after the triumphal entry is cleanse the temple, which is claiming sacred space by the king. And in the midst of doing that, uh, in the midst of making this public declaration, really force the hand of those uh, at the temple temple and those who are leading in the city to make a decision pro or con about what they think about what he's doing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Gary, how do you see the authority of Jesus being uh, shown in this in this scene here? Well, I think it's quite uh, amazing. I think as Daryl just said, it kind of sets the table and it raises all kinds of questions. If you're going to be careful about who you say you are and then you start revealing it maybe in bits and pieces or, you know, the mark and messianic secret and all these things but then you're, it's he's reaching the time where it's gonna it's gonna come out and you know it's not long after this what just a matter of days when he's going to be before the priests and to me i mean daryl's written maybe the best book on the subject but to me um that's the most amazing proclamation he's been quiet for all this time and he's going to come out and make some uh, statements that are going him going to get him blamed with blasphemy and fit to die. So it's it certainly ushers in the the beginning of the end. Mm-hmm. And there's another detail that's important versus the way this is popularly conceived. At least the triumphal entry, the po- the the picture that you get in popular expectation about this event is that the whole city welcomed him and then, you know, later on in the week the same city is rejecting him and, you know, how does that happen Mm -hmm. and the shock of that turnover. But I actually think a careful reading of the text suggests that's not quite what happened. What happened was the disciples were proclaiming who he was. They were bringing a lot of attention. And the general environment of the event that they are attending is festive. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and so, again, I'll go back to the football analogy. It's like a football crowd going to a game before the game. They're all excited and you know about the competition and what's going to happen and how that's going to play out. And so everyone's reacting. So some people are praising Jesus because of who he is and their connection to him, but other people are just joining in because the time itself is festive. Right. And, and so I think that takes the edge off the so-called switch in Jerusalem of people who are so for Jesus at the beginning of the week end up being against him at the end. I actually don't think that's what what happened. I think what you had is people were presenting Jesus. They were they were vocal and certainly present and effective. And then a, a second thing that was going on was a lot of the crowd was just coming into into town to celebrate to celebrate the feast. And so um, so that's that's important. There's one other important part of the detail that sometimes gets mentioned by skeptics. Skeptics say, well, if Jesus really went out and presented himself as a king right there at the beginning, you know, why didn't the Ro- Roman soldiers simply arrest him at the time? Mm-hmm. And the explanation that I just went through is actually the explanation for that. Mm. Uh, you have 120 or so disciples who've gathered with Jesus, who've come in from Galilee with him, that's the number that was in the upper room later, who are presenting Jesus. But you've got this crowd thronging to the city in a festive mood, um, coming to celebrate the feast. And so everybody's in a, in a how can I say, uproarious mood, mm-hmm. if I can say it that way. And so as long as nothing violent is happening, um, there's nothing that signals um, in a significant way that there's any danger or any violence or any disruption going on that would draw the attention of soldiers, particularly over a distance. If you've ever been to Jerusalem and you've you've looked out over the Western Wall towards the Mount of Olives, that's a long distance. Mm-hmm. And you know, cars are specks and people are half specks. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily be seeing as someone's coming in on the Mount of Olives um, all that celebration and 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 the noise that would be generated would be the noise of a huge, large crowd, not necessarily the specific noise of what's happening yeah. around someone riding a donkey coming into the city. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Even the, the sign on the cross later on um, that we see, the King of the Jews, that kind of speaks to the historicity of this, doesn't it? Yeah. It, I mean, everything rotates around the cross. Um, you know, uh, why is Jesus put to death? Uh, everything that's associated with that, we're probably coming to a discussion. We talk about the different motives as to what put Jesus on the cross, depending on whether you were a Roman or, or a Jewish mm-hmm. leader. Uh, but the the challenge of the laying down of the palm leaves and Jesus entering in is it is this announcement and presentation of the arrival of a, of a of a king. Some people might have seen it just as the arrival of some kind of a dignitary, something like that. They may not have been able to specify. In fact, John tells us they didn't realize the connection to Zechariah until after Jesus was glorified, which mm. is a way of referring to his death. So a lot of people didn't put together the symbolism until you know. Upon further review, since yeah. we're using football illustrations, and uh, um, and, and so uh, uh, you know everything is kind of presenting itself, and and people are having to reflect. Now, what's interesting is the Jewish leaders get it. They they walk out to Jesus' disciples and they say, you know, tell them to stop. And Jesus responds by saying, well, if these disciples weren't doing what they were doing, the rocks would cry out. And this is one of those cases where in Scripture, when creation speaks, we're supposed to listen. And when there's the possibility of creation speaking, we're supposed to listen. So all the rhetoric of what is surrounding this event coming from the people who are participating in it is sending a signal of this is something to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. But I do think that a lot of people who were uh, around the fringes of the event really had no clue what was going on, and the leadership was rejecting what was taking place, even though they understood the symbolism. Mm-hmm. So if Jesus is presenting himself as a dignitary or, or a king, uh, if you get it, then it's time to follow him. Uh, unless At least not, pay attention. Yeah, uh, yeah. If he's not who he claims to be, then we need to stop him at this point. Exactly right. So it raises the tension. Of course, when Jesus goes in, the next thing he does is go into the temple and cleanse it. And now that really does ratchet up the pressure. Mm-hmm. The leaders are responsible for the temple. It's a rebuke of the way the temple is operating. And he's really, at that point, forcing forcing their hand in terms of making a decision about him. Mm-hmm. It's a claim of sacred space. In fact, it's the most sacred space on earth 
forth as far as a Jewish person is concerned because it represents the presence of God. And so there is <laughs> there's no wriggle room for the leaders uh, once he goes in and cleanses the temple. They either have to be supportive of what he's done or stop it.